Chapter 20, the Gospel of Luke. There's your outline, 47 verses. And those 47 verses plus four more in chapter 21, it, the, the key players are challenging Jesus' authority, the priests, the Sadducees, the scribes. And Jesus predicted that all the way back in chapter 9. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Now, in between those three batches of challenges, Jesus in his different, different refutations goes through these pieces on the bottom, the parable of the wicked ten tenants, which again has an end time prophecy associated with it, the paying of taxes, the Sadducees and talking about the resurrection. Whose son is the Christ? And that's where we're going to tie back again to Psalm 118 and also 2 Samuel. Beware of the scribes. So, Luke chapter 20. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, he was teaching and he was preaching. He started in the synagogue of Nazareth and he ended his career in the temple. And this is Luke chapter 4. We've covered that weeks and weeks ago. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Remember, we talked about the crowds. They started with a whisper, and then an echo. People were saying things, and other people were saying things. And then the logos, people were repeating his words. So sort of like a tidal wave this thing, or uh, an avalanche or a snowball, this thing starts picking up, picking up, and picking up on momentum. What does that have to do with us? For to this you have been called, because Jesus also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Now, I've been blessed with the spiritual gift of teaching. Somebody else, if I said, here, you take over the class, you might pass out. In fact, my sister-in-law in a public speaking class, she did pass out. She turned around, she looked at the class, and she hit the deck. But each of us are called to be an example by word, by deed. First John tells us this, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Jesus taught, Jesus preached, Jesus led by example, and in fact, at one point, there was a fad where people wear the bracelet, WWJD. What would Jesus do? The chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up, and some, sa some said, tell us by what authority you do these things, or who is it that gave you this authority? Now, has anyone ever heard about the umpire named Bill Clem? No. Okay, there was a Major League Baseball game where the ball was hit to the outfield. The outfielder takes the ball and throws it home. The runner that was already on base and scoring position comes around third, comes home. The ball, the runner, the catcher, and the umpire all collide. And the one team is yelling, he's safe, he's safe, he's safe. And the other team is yelling, he's out, he's out, he's out. And Bill Clemens says, he ain't nothing until I call it. It was his authority because he was the umpire. And the scribes, they say, who are you to do these things? Let me tell you something. If I had a loved one that was lame or blind and somebody healed them, I wouldn't be worried about what the person's authority was. I would just be very, very thankful. The issue was this. As Jesus' popularity was growing, their popularity was shrinking. With that popularity comes power. And as Jesus, as a gentle bend kind of power, is growing, these guys' power, they've already been shoved aside by the Romans. They've already been snubbed. They're shrinking. The high priest said, it's expedient that one man should die than the nation to perish. What a mouthful, because that one man died, and the world doesn't have to perish. And he answered them, I also ask you this question. It's so sweet how Jesus doesn't take the bait every time the Pharisees try to pull this stuff off. 
He turns things around back on them. He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Now, I think the women have learned how to ask questions from Jesus. I'm coming up on my 49th wedding anniversary, and she still asks me questions that are impossible to answer. A great example, although I don't wear a necktie anymore. Are you wearing that tie? No, I'm just practicing my knots, right? You can't answer those kinds of questions. And that was Jesus was a master at that. He said, I also ask you a question. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another. They were stumped, stumped the chump, right? And they discussed it with one another saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? Now, keep in mind, John the Baptist was not very kind in his words to the Pharisees. He said, you vipers. He said, show me your works of repentance and then I'll baptize you. Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death for they are convinced that John was a prophet. See, the people were much smarter than their leaders were. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So he managed to back right out of that. There are a series of these questions and answers. And the one I love the best is the Sadducees, where they talk about the seven men that died and in the resurrection, who's going to be the husband? We'll get to that. The parable of the wicked tenants. The owner will be God the Father. The vineyard will be the nation of Israel. The vine growers are the religious rulers of Israel, the chief priests, the scribes, the lawyers, the elders, and the slaves are the prophets of God that were persecuted and killed. And the other tenants, that's the church. Again, there's a, there's a prophetic uh, flavor to this. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. The nation of Israel will, be, will have been abandoned as a nation. Individuals continue to be saved. There are some wonderful Messianic Jews. But as a nation, they're blinded. And the Son, of course, will be the Lord Jesus. Now, with those definitions, we can read the parable. And he began to tell the people this parable. I highlighted the phrase, the people, because we spoke about this earlier when he was at that big dinner party. He was speaking directly to some people, but he was indirectly speaking to other people. But in this case, it's the other way around. He's telling the story to the people, but he's really trying to get the Pharisees' attention. And he began to tell the people this parable. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was talking about them. That's a great big duh, right? A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants. Matthew adds that it wasn't just a vineyard. There was a wine press. There was a tower. It was a nice piece of real estate. And when the time came, he sent a servant, a doulos, a slave. And when the time came, he sent a slave to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Now, while we're concentrating on that word servant, keep in mind, Paul said he was a servant. King James says bond servant. He was a doulos of Christ. And he sent another servant, one prophet after another. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent a third. And this one also they wounded and cast out. I'm going to go back over to Luke chapter 13. Again, he's putting it right in their faces. He says, oh, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your chicks together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you would not let me. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son, my only begotten son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir, let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. The law at that time was if there was no clear uh, heir, the place was up for grabs. 
And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. What happened in 70 AD? He destroyed and he gave the grapes to the Gentiles. And when they heard this, they said, surely not. They couldn't, there was such injustice there, but he was talking about them. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Here's where I'm bringing together Psalm 118 and all the things that are happening, triumphal entry and right now. Psalm 118, verse 22 is the quote, the stone that builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. The kids sing that, but the people sang that when they came to Jerusalem three times a year. Save us, Hosanna, we pray, O Lord. That was what was happening the day prior. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were singing that psalm ever since they were told on Passover, you got to go to the tabernacle. And now on this particular holy week, all those pieces, I always say Paul never had these problems. Paul said to those leaders of the Ephesian church, he said, beware of the wolves in sheep's clothing. They come up from among you. They'll deliver heresies. And that's a totally different subject. But the same thing has occurred throughout the centuries. Heresy after heresy has come up from the, from the top end, the leadership. Uh, there have been, uh, just like the Old Testament, they killed and persecuted uh, the prophets, people like Tyndale, the Anabaptists. Many Christians have been martyred by other Christians. So this, there's a parallel here. The first was Old Testament. This one is New Testament. The slaves, Old Testament, they were those prophets. New Testament, the martyrs and the true interpreters of God's word. And the son, of course, is still Jesus Christ. Okay. Jesus, a rock and a stone. Referring back to chief cornerstone, verse 17. To God, Jesus is the smitten stone. And this goes once again back to Moses. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. He was the smitten stone. To Israel, he's a stumbling stone. In fact, Paul said that uh, the gospel was a stumbling block to the Jew and foolishness to the Greek. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly, or King James foolishness, to the Greeks. To the church, Jesus is the cornerstone. A cornerstone, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and the Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. To the Gentile world powers, looking again into end times, he's a stone cut without hands. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's vision with the head of gold and gone down the silvers and, the, and on down to the toes, mixed with iron mixed with clay. And as you looked, a stone, this is Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. 
and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. A stone cut without hands is Jesus Christ. And he's coming back, Revelation chapter 19, and he's going to destroy all the world powers, the world government, the world church, the world economy, and he's going to set up his one world church and his one world government and his one world religion for the most part for a thousand years. There'll be those that'll get deceived. Satan's in the bottomless pit, but you don't need Satan to sin. James tells us, and lust when it hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. To Israel at the second coming, Jesus is the capstone. And this is Zechariah. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and you shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. We had a Bible study today. We're talking about Moses not being allowed into the promised land. And somebody said, wasn't that a little bit harsh? He had a breach of faith and in his anger, he struck the rock. And the only answer I could give comes from John's gospel. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. If I had a choice between mercy and justice, Give me mercy every time. To the unbelievers, the Lord Jesus Christ is the crushing stone of judgment. Matthew tells us this. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And this comes out of the Life Application Study Bible. The choice is yours. Broken before him or crushed by him. takes us to the next segment in the challenges of Christ's authority. And here they're going to talk about religious allegiance versus civil allegiance. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. Keep in mind, the Sanhedrin lost their power to, to sentence somebody to death. They lost their capital punishment. It only belonged to the Romans. Psalm 37 talks about this. The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. And you see where I have there, how many prophecies, question, exclamation, question, exclamation. I paused in my study and I went, uh, went out and I Googled, uh, I Googled number of prophecies fulfilled by Jesus. Some came back in the 40s. Some came back in the 300s. But there are many, many like this kind of thing that aren't even counted. In John's gospel, he wrote that if, if everything that Jesus did, not even the world itself, could contain all the books. So paying taxes to Caesar. So they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality. That's like buttering up the teacher before you say something amiss. But truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? A or B? Once again, Jesus doesn't take the bait saying, I'll take A or I'll take B. And so what they're doing here before they launch the question, they're giving flattery. Now I have their flattery is the reverse image of gospel, of gossip. Flattery is telling something to somebody that you'd never tell anybody else. Gossip is telling everybody else something you'd never tell to somebody. There was somebody else that did the same trick. Of course, for Nicodemus, he turned the corner. This is John chapter 3. You read John chapter 19, and Nicodemus is now a believer. You read of the burial of Christ, and Nicodemus is Joseph of Arimathea, his accomplice. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. 
I don't know when exactly Nicodemus got saved. Did he come into this audience with Jesus as a skeptic? Did he go out saved? Did he go out wondering and get saved later? The good news is that he, in fact, got saved. But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarius, show me a Roman coin. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. Keep in mind, Jesus just cleansed the temple. These people were swapping out Roman money for their own money. They, they were dealing with the Roman money when it suited them. They said, it's Caesar's inscription. So what's Jesus' response? Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said. But marveling at his answer, they became silent. This comes from Job. Once again, who's going to count all the prophecies? He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their own craftiness. These were the elite. These were the MITs and Harvards and Yale people of the nation. He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are brought to a quick end. So then the Sadducees kick in. They came, there came to him some Sadducees. Now, keep in mind, there was division in the ranks, just like we have division in our country today. We've got Democrats, we've got Republicans, we've got Independents, we've got Libertarians. And the Sadducees were at odds with the Pharisees and the scribes. And there came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. <coughs> now, Acts chapter 23 is Paul's defense in front of the, the council before he was taken off to Caesarea. And he explains that there are more things that the Sadducees were different on. For the Sadducees there, say there is no religion, nor angel, nor spirit. Christ's answer is going to come back and leverage all these things that Paul said they don't believe in. And they asked them a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. And this goes again and again seven times, and they all die without kids. And finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, now keep in mind who's the spokesperson here. They're saying, there is no resurrection. But if there is, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. Now, these were all students of the Old Testament. The difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees is that the Pharisees accepted it all, but the Sadducees didn't put much weight, much weight on the prophets. And it's Daniel's prophecy that talks about the resurrection. And so the Sadducees are saying, eh, so much for Daniel. It's not in the Torah, not in the Pentateuch. So Jesus is not going to take them to Daniel. He's going to take them to the Pentateuch. And Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, because there is one, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore. There's a hereafter. There's another life. And that's another thing that the Sadducees didn't quite buy into. And that's why they came up with the eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow they die. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to the angels that you don't believe in either. And are the sons of God. The Old Testament refers to the angels as sons of God. Being sons of the resurrection but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed. I underlined Moses because he's now taking a, a, a scenario from the Pentateuch. Even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, and now he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Moses lived 
about 500 years after Abraham lived. And so he's saying, God is the God of the living. Abraham is very much alive. There is a life after death. There are angels. And oh, by the way, our love for the Savior will be so immense. And our love for one another in heaven will be so powerful that the love that we now know as a marriage, quite the bond, will be a, a, a nothing. Now watch how he pulls side against side. Then some of the scribes answered. So Jesus used the divide and conquer technique. Then some of the scribes answered, teacher, you have spoken well. Well, why did they give him a, a, a kudo? Because Jesus is underscoring the beliefs of the scribes and the Pharisees, for they no longer dare to ask him any question. But he said to them, how can they say that Christ is David's son? The notion of the son of David begins even with Joseph, the stepfather. But I want to cut in in Matthew 12. And all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? The people, the ones that had the elementary school education, but not the college or the university or the seminary or anything else. The ones that had trades as opposed to those who dedicated their entire full-time life to studying the Bible. They figured it out. They said, can this be? the son of David. So I want you to look at 2 Samuel. This is God speaking through Nathan to David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Wasn't talking about the Solomon's temple. Jesus said to Peter, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, I want you to look at that same verse again with the red. There you see who shall come from your own body, the son of David. And there you see, I will be to him a father, the son of God. How could that possibly be? The offspring, the bloodline of David comes down through Mary. And Mary was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Son of David, son of God. For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And in the hearing of all the people, keep in mind he had quite the audience. The chief priests were there, the scribes were there, the elders were there, the Sadducees were there, the Pharisees were there, and the people were there. The people are hearing this dialogue. The people were smarter than the Pharisees. They figured out chapters earlier that he was the son of David. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts and devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. So that sounds so old-fashioned. James tells us, not many of us should be teachers because theirs is a more strict judgment. 